Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Catholic Culture Podcast. Uh, I apologize for my scratchy voice. I'm getting over a little bit of a cold here. And happy Easter, everybody, by the way, since this is the the first episode uh, coming out uh, since Easter. Uh, So today's uh, guest will be Marley Yeomans, who is an author of uh, several novels and several books of poetry. Her most recent novel is Karis in the World of Wonders, a novel set in Puritan New England. And uh, today we're going to be talking, though, about her most recent uh, book of poetry, a verse tale, actually a fairy tale told in verse, something you don't get to see too much anymore, which is great. Saren of the Wildwood, published by our friends over at Wise Blood Books. And uh, so I'm really excited to talk about this really unique work with uh, Marley Yeomans. Marley, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for the invitation. This is a verse tale, and um, it's a mix of a couple of different sort of classic forms, right? It's it's a mix of iambic pentameter and also this thing called the bob and wheel. Now, the bob and wheel, maybe perhaps you can explain what the bob and wheel is and w- where it comes from. Well, I borrowed it from Sir Gawain in the Green Knight from the Gawain poet, and you can – Let's see if I can hold it up. You can see the blank verse body here and then the tiny little short line bob followed by the wheel. And so there is an, this, the first uh, section, the rhyme is trees, ears, please, hears, sees. So it's just an A, B uh, rhyme, but with one tiny little bob before the wheel. Can I ask, is there anything in particular that led you to choose those, the, the combinations of a, a more, you know, quote unquote, modern, you know, mm-hmm. for a verse form and the bob and wheel? Well, Wildwood, the territory in the poem is a sort of mixture of times and places. And I just felt that a... Um, a mixture in form would be interesting as well. Although I can't say that I really thought about it that analytically. I just instinctively mm-hmm. picked it and then realized that really fits. So what I'm trying to do. So, Yeah, well, um, it is an interesting mix of kind of <clears throat> mythological and even biblical and uh, sort of high and low fairy, you know, uh, elements in in the story. And we'll, we'll get into that. But maybe we can go ahead and, uh, if you don't mind, have you read a little excerpt to give people a taste of the, the beginning of this, this tale. All right. I'll skip the prologue material since so many readers skip beginnings. And I'll skip right into the story and read the first of five small sections. Great. Never speak your passions by the wildwood. The heedfulness that might have saved their lives from harm was torn in two, and afterward they were dismayed, bewildered by surprise. The father looked as handsome as a dream of elvishness, a man whose element seemed fire, his aura crackling energy, his potent green-eyed glance a stream of sparks. The mother softer, secretive, blue-eyed, her element not fire but water, force that mines the roots of mountains, flies to clouds. Was he too proud of flame, too rich in youth? Did she demand too much in quietness? Or did their beauty lure the wildwood's stare? Of course, He was the one to speak the words, sudden, wrathful, turning on the children, two little boys who leaped in reckless joy and never thought of punishment and doom. I wish I had a daughter, not you boys, who shut your ears and are no help to me. The edge of things is always dangerous, and trees may shelter eyes and ears that do not care to please, the shade where something hears, the dark where something sees. Two, what hears and laughs at us from wildwood leaves? 
Is it the fays, the faded ones who slip and weave through leaves and branches soundlessly, the tall medieval elves who sing of loss? Is it mere fairies, dwindled down from elves, or else made small and soulless from the start? Might it be demons curled in flower cups, and murmuring a malediction song? Or do the fallen angels seek out shade, their spirits winding to and fro like snakes, each seeking to seduce some human soul in darkness underneath the wildwood's boughs? Whatever breeze it was that stirred the leaves, some rustling presence marked the father's cry and laughed to hear the spill of thoughtless words so that he paused and turned uneasily to face the trees before he shepherded his sons toward home. But from that very day, they changed, diminishing from what had been, their merriment at ebb, their features thin, their eyes the wisdom wells of suffering. What power led him that very night to seed the woman's flower? Who called a child toward light from her conception's hour? Three. And so the little boys went sickening into the darkness, mystery, and fate. Though no one knew a good wherefore or why, the infant in her mother's belly thrived as if she drank her brother's strength away. They four, the mother, brothers, unborn babe, lay slumbering or waking on the bed, the two dwindling, one grieving, one swelling. The father boiled spring water in a shell and called upon the air to bring sons home, to banish changelings from their heart. No use, no earthly use, for that was not their doom. The mother labored hard and bore a girl as brimming full of health as a fresh plum so that they marveled at her coloring and beauty, though the mother also wept, for weariness and sadness ruled her days. That night the parents dreamed the self-same dream of healing fragrant flames on the hearthstone and brothers playing, laughing in the fire, who turned to smile and give one radiant look. Morning brought long-expected news Called mirror, sounds of warning, a sunrise like a bruise, woe despite forewarning. And here they are, the little boys. Four. Fresh woven in the mornings for three days, the wreaths of violets and forget-me-nots cradled the head of boys who seemed to sleep within a fragrant box of applewood while in the yard the wings from fresh plain trim were stirred and lifted by an idle breeze, as if such thoughtless things could wish to fly. The rosy child was passed from hand to hand, neighbors finding solace in the new. The father hunched alone, his bandaged hands held awkwardly before the scrap-fed fire. The mother couldn't be made comforted, but paced and cried along the forest edge, her hair disheveled and her clothing torn. And when the time was come to tuck the boys to sleep like dormant seeds inside the ground, she struck the boards as if to smash away into the night of earth that held such stars. Later, the father and the mother lay not touching, no, nor lightening their pain marooned upon the ice flow of the sheets. The ark of cradle rocked the child, who babbled to a spark of star, by light beguiled in the unbrothered dark. Five. A strange beginning for a human babe, to watch her mother's face be like a sky with skimming clouds and flashes of bright beams but also rain in downpours without end, or sleet and snow that comes down soft and deep and wants to cover everything in white until the world is still with sleep and hush. One day the mother kneeled to hook a chain around the baby's throat 
with heart of lead to warm against the skin and make her tug the heavy, unaccustomed thing away. And stamped on the soft metal were two words, my savior. For the mother said the child had saved her from the madness of raw grief. And once the girl went toddling out of doors so that her mother shrieked and fled to look in well and cellar and the verge of woods as wild with fear as she had been before until she found her sitting in an aisle of summer buds and flowers washed by sun and tended by the buzz of honeybees as if she had been drawn by loveliness or some siren hum in nature that lured the child to come to see to adventure, creation's secret thrum. This book begins with three epigraphs um, from Genesis, from uh, Tolkien's essay on fairy stories, and from uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh. And uh, the first... The first Genesis uh, quote refers to the, the giants uh, um, that are referred to a couple times in Genesis. Um, and uh, the, the Tolkien uh, quote uh, is, in fairy and drama, you are in a dream that some other mind is weaving. And the Gilgamesh quote is, two thirds of him is God, one third of him is human. And, and this kind of, the, the three epigraphs do a good job of sort of giving an idea of the kind of things that you're putting together in this book. So I wanted to just ask you to talk generally about what are the kind of different sources you're drawing on and, and combining in this story? Um, we are, you talked about the different verse forms already, but what are, what are some of the inspirations uh, for this, for this work? I actually did very little research for this. I could say that the only actual looking up of anything I did was to find the epigraphs, which I remembered and thought fit, even though I don't normally use epigraphs. Um, mm -hmm. I do think that this particular story goes way back for me, uh, you know, back to early childhood, back to, I had a librarian for mother, so I was given many good books and I, uh, read a lot of fairy tales. There are a lot of fairy tales with giants. Um, there are a lot of literary fairy tales as well by people like Oscar Wilde, George MacDonald. And I, I certainly encountered Gilgamesh fairly early. I also, you know, by the time I was 20, the year I was 20 and 21, I took a year of old English. And so, you know, there's a bit of the giant in Beowulf with Grendel and his mother, um, Beowulf himself, you could describe biblically as, you know, as one of the mighty men, men of renown, uh, hmm. who himself seems overly, doesn't quite fit in the world. So I think there were a lot of things sort of built up, and I was kind of surprised to realize that I had written about giants before. I had forgotten a short story I wrote called Tall Jorinda. Probably, I don't know, probably more than 30 years ago. That was about uh, a giant in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And I found some poems mm -hmm. as well that dealt with giants. But I have to say that many of the things in Saren of the Wildwood did come from listening to Lord of Spirits, a podcast. Okay, I was going to ask you this. Since <laughs> since you're Orthodox, I was wondering if you've heard this, probably the greatest podcast episode of all time. Uh, it's a podcast by two, the Lord of Spirits by two Orthodox priests. Right. And the, they did this episode talking about the Nephilim. Right. And basically, yeah. yeah so, so, yeah, tell us about, about that. Yes, I, I definitely was really caught by that, which I think actually that, Probably most people are. It seems to be really a lot of people. Yeah, that episode really made the rounds, right. Yeah, it was extremely popular. But yeah, I mean, I've never really quite understood the business about Gilgamesh. You know, how was he two thirds God? How does that work? 
And nor had I understood things in the Bible that, you know, I'd bumped into about giants and the giant clan, the giant clans, the Canaanites, the Horites, all those ites, the Anakim yeah. and others. I really didn't quite get all that, but, you know, the way you just sort of bump over it and ignore it as best you can. And really, Lord of Spirits does bring a lot of insight to how ancient people thought and the things they assumed that they didn't need to put into a written record because they probably didn't think those things would get lost ever because they knew them so well themselves. And so, you know, Saren of the Wawa does depend to some degree on that idea of the ritual in which you provide a uh, God, King, Father, a uh, a God, Father, and you have a ritual in which a child is sired on a temple slave or a temple prostitute. And these things were going on all around the world at the time and, and uh, you no know, mystery to people of that time that that's how pagan rituals, a certain kind of pagan ritual happened. But that over time, as the centuries passed, we lost all understanding that. And certainly I had no understanding of that and what it meant for Gilgamesh. And actually I think Gilgamesh has uh, a goddess, is uh, Minson, I think her name is. Um, his father is Lugobanda, and the goddess is Minson. So all of that was really intriguing to me, really interesting. And I listened to it a long time before I thought, a uh, long time before I thought of writing this book and found it fascinating. And it just came back later when um, I decided to. I'd been very busy. I've had uh, some very demanding few years here where I've done a lot of caretaking and I'm away from home, you know, 900 miles away from home a lot of the time. And then I realized that I had two months that were kind of free with not much happening. And I decided I would just that practically, I'm going to write a long poem because I feel the itch, mm. didn't know what I was going to write it about. And... I'm going to write a section or more every single day until I'm done. And so I went about it in a very practical way. It doesn't seem like it could have been a very practical way, but that's how I was thinking of it. Is I'm going to do this. I don't know what it is. And I did. So. So this is this is the only book I've read by you. So are your previous works of poetry are, are any of those narrative or are they lyric poems or what? Um, I have one other book length poem called Thaliad, uh, which is people call it a tend to call it post apocalyptic. Something has happened to the world. A group of children wander, establish a home. Um, I actually used my own movement from being a southerner, coming north, and made the home they chose something like Cooperstown, where I live most of the time. And, um, and Cooperstown is one of these very strange places. I don't know how many of them feel like this, where the line between Fiction and reality seems to be eroded a little bit. You know, we have, I look out the back window, the castle in the lake. Um, there's a lot of stuff named after fictional things because this was the home of James Fenmore Cooper. His father, Judge Cooper, established the town. So I've always thought there's a lot of things in Cooper, Cooperstown that feel a little fantastical. And um, so I think that's kind of affected my mind a little bit with um, Saren, but also a bit with Thaliad. 
So your other book, books of verse, are they lyric poems or still narrative but shorter? Or? Um, some a mixture, you know, some lyric poems, some mid length narrative poems. Okay. Uh, I am. I tend to be. I mean, maybe it's because I've written a lot of novels, but I have the itch to tell stories fairly frequently, and right. I feel that we just fell away from all of that in the last right. century. And, you know, we ended up with a world in which we had one page poems. And I actually like right. to see what you can do in a poem that is different right. from what, you know, became the norm. Yeah. And just for the listener, yeah, this, so this poem is about, it's about 60 pages, maybe a little more. 62 with the prologue. Yep. Okay. 62. Okay. Um, so yeah, to go back to the, the whole giants thing, um, because this is a, a central part of the story is that uh, Sarah and this girl is, they live alongside this wood and uh, she is lured in by this, this uh you know, fairy voice, whatever it is, this, this voice that sort of seduces her and lures her into the woods. And, but then she ends up getting trapped in this, um, what ends up being this, this pagan ritual that you mentioned and dealing with the, the consequences of that and becoming a mother, um, to, uh, an unusual, uh, creature. And <clears throat> I'm really glad I had heard that Lord of Spirits episode because it gave me a real, a framework to, understand what was going on, you know, immediately. But if, if somebody, you know, if, if somebody isn't familiar with this, then, uh, you know, the frame of reverence might be like Rosemary's Baby or, or, or something like that in a way, um, a film that I regret seeing. But <laughs> but still, it's very it, – it is ac apparently accurate to an actual, you know, pagan ritual, you know, that, that was – common across many different cultures. I mean, in that episode, they talk about even being in Japan, uh, as well as, you know, the, the Canaanites and all these different people that the, the Israelites had to deal with. And um, so, yeah, I mean, the idea was that you'd have the king and the king was himself considered to be divine. Right. And then you'd have the, um, the, uh, the god that would be essentially like possessing the king during this ritual and then you'd have the obviously the human element so that's that's the idea of Gilgamesh being two-thirds divine one-third one-third human and uh so that it would create these these children who are um perhaps physically unusual perhaps of unusual stature but also just of unusual character and temperament and sort of these these a lot of these great heroes of mythology were produced in this way, which sort of gives you a different perspective on them. You know, like uh, maybe Hercules or whoever it might be. Um, and uh, and so, I mean, to to put it in, um, you know, in Christian terms, you know, you would have these like basically children who are possessed from the moment of conception. So in that Lord of Spirits episode, they talk about it as being kind of a, a mockery of the, you know, the Immaculate Conception uh, or no, sorry, no, um, not the Immaculate Conception. I made the, the classic error that, that so many people make uh, the, the a mockery of the virgin birth of, of Christ. Um, and so what's interesting about it too, is that, you know, uh, you mix in these kind of like these elements that we know from fairy stories with some of these more, um elements that are that are rooted in real pagan practices ancient practices and things from more of the ancient mythology um and so it gives it an unusual tone um and uh so we've got the enchanted wood obviously a very common and familiar fairy tale you know thing um but then some of these more ancient kind of um aspects that are i don't want to say realistic but in a sense more sort of like um spiritually realistic in, in that like you can sort of put your finger on what's going on here like because you talk early early in the story it's the narrator you know is talking about um all these different possibilities of what these beings all these different types of beings that that live in the wild wood and uh 
you know, some of them could be demons, some of them are fairies, but you know, that obviously raises the question, what is a fairy? That's a, you know, mm -hmm. big point of discussion. And many people have come up with different answers to that, um, even in like a fictional context. But, um, but then when you get to this ritual, it's pretty, you know, for a Christian reader, obviously, it's pretty c clear that this isn't just another kind of like ambiguous kind of you know, being this is a, a sort of a demonic pagan situation. And so to mix those elements is interesting because they get there's like a there's still all these elements that are kind of mysterious and just fairy and numinous. And then there's that 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 element that the element of evil is like very clear, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I think that um, when people talk about fairy or they talk about mythology or uh, Christianity as true myth, you know, right. they, they tend to kind of isolate those into different areas. And um, mm -hmm. I think actually, if you look back farther in time, that there are other literary works that do kind of mingle these things or braid them together in a kind of interesting way. I, I had not thought about this until uh, last night, really, but I was thinking about the ballad um, Thomas the Rhymer, which is uh, also called you know, True Thomas or Thomas of, I think it's Urkeldoon. And mm -hmm. that is a ballad. There are a number of different versions of it. I think there are five main versions of it. And... Thomas is carried away by the queen of fairy and he, he's saved in the end. But, um, you know, while he's in elf land, as it's called, he sees different, what we would think of as different worlds sort of side by side. I mean, he sees the road to heaven. He sees the road to fairy or elf land he sees the road to hell. And he also, in one of the versions, he sees the tree of forbidden fruit. So you get a little bit of Eden in there too. And they're all sort of braided together and they exist within the same ballad. So right. I, I don't think it's totally new to mix them up that way. I... Mm -hmm also think that um well beowulf does too right, to an extent yeah. as well i mean even just referring to the the descendants of cain and right things like that yeah one of one of the theories of where fairies come from yeah right so um so i mean spoiler alert for for the audience um you know uh saren ends up having this child that's a result of this ritual and so um there's this like very fraught, you know, motherhood that occurs in, in the last part of the poem. And um, I don't know, what, what were you thinking about? Because I, obviously, you know, some of these elements are uh, pre-existing, but I hadn't read a story where, you know, uh, you know, Rosemary's baby, <laughs> to use that example, ends with, you know, the revelation of what this child is, mm -hmm, right. right? And so you don't deal with the, how is this, who's raising this child? How is this actually turning out? What is the character of this child as he grows up? You know, so, so what do you, um, um, and I don't mean to equate your story with Rosemary's baby, um, uh, because you. it's not, but, but so what do you, what are you dealing with? Uh, what are you thinking in dealing with this, the actual attempt of Saren to bring up this child for a period of time? Well, I think there are a couple of different elements there and maybe more than I've even thought of. Um, one of them is it did not seem surprising to me that, well, though really pretty much everything that happened in Saren was a surprise to me, that she would have a son and I thought there was some strange relationship between the um, disruption of the family by the death of the boys and this 
kind of eruption, um, you know, that there's psychologically some kind of reworking, rethinking of what went on in some way. So there's that, but also I think, you know, if you compare it with a poem like Gawain, there's a period of testing and Gawain feels that he has failed. And yet the emblem of his dishonor, which is the green sash that the lady gave him to protect him, becomes a kind of badge of honor back at Arthur's court. So I think of this also as a kind of testing period, one which she very frequently feels that she has failed, but which has, which changes her, which leads to, I would have to say to, in Tolkienian terms, that there is a eucatastrophe at the close. I also, you know, it's funny that I just didn't think about Thomas the Rhymer until last night because I thought that's an interesting comparison because Thomas the Rhymer is about to be given as a tithe to hell. He's in danger. He's been in Elfland too long and the queen wants to save him and sends him back to the world and she tells him that she will give him a gift she will give him the ability to harp or she will give him the ability to carp and one would be a gift of music to play and sing with the harp the other one turns out to be the one that he takes and it's a gift related to prophecy words storytelling making things out of words and really, there is a kind of parallel to Sarah, which I never noticed until last night, um, where she too finds a gift that this whole region of Wildwood is a sort of region of the imagination where you're going through adventures in a realm um, governed by imagination and you come out of it with a gift of being able to wield story and give that to the people around you. So it reminded me of other things too. I have to say when I was thinking about it last night, uh, I also thought about Pandora's box where so many ill things come out. And then at the very end, out flies hope with her hmm. rainbow wings. Right. This book has some really cool art in it um, on the cover and inside the book. And I was looking up this artist, Clive Hicks Jenkins, and he is apparently a pretty big deal uh, in the UK, uh, this Welsh artist. And he's done a lot of your books. So... Can you tell me a little about him and, and your working relationship with him over the years? Yeah, I wrote something about Clive on my blog back when people used to do blogs in a serious way. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned him and he saw that and said that he went and read my entire blog up to that point, which was a feat, and um, then later wrote me. And we wrote back and forth very intensively for probably around a year. Um, mm. We had certain things, we're very different, but we had certain things in common and certain interests in common. And so, um, I don't know, we were, we were inspiring to each other and We've remained friends. We don't write all the time like we did in that first year. But um, we, I think we still are very trusting of each other. He will take um, a manuscript of mine and will read it several times 
he tends to not want to straight up illustrate. So there'll be an interesting relationship between his images and the poem. So for one like Thaliad, you know, there was a real folk art motif and he's thinking, well, she's, you know, interested in uh, picking up and playing with American motifs that way. So, yeah, um, we're in touch a lot and um, we admire each other's work and, and minds. So, yeah, it's a good friendship. I went over for his, uh, he had a big retrospective show of his paintings and also um, including some of his book arts. And it was mm. wonderful. This is great. a great event. Right. Yeah, I'd like to see more of his work. I, I read that he had um, he had done illustrations for... What was it? Um, the Simon Armitage mm -hmm. translation of Sir Gawain, and then also is doing uh, an upcoming Folio Society edition of uh, Seamus Haney's uh, Beowulf translation. Um, so, I mean, yeah, that's a pretty pretty cool. Um, yeah, and he, he also so, uh, has received yeah. the annual um, VNA Victoria and Albert Award for illustration. Which is pretty wonderful when it's not even his main string to his bow. So, right. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm very lucky that he's loved my work and that we've been friends. So, sweet. So, um, you know, to talk about fairy more generally, I mean, what uh, do you fall into any particular school of thought about kind of what? what they represent, what, it, it, let's say, in sort of some of the classic stories, some of the classic medieval uh, fairy stories, what, what are these, what do these creatures actually represent to you? Not, not talking about like the demonic spirits that are explicitly labeled as such in, in your story, but some of these more ambiguous beings. Hmm. Well, I mean, I find the legends behind them, the explanations behind them interesting uh, and curious, you know, the descendants of Cain or the dirty children that were behind the door when God came to see Eve and so on. I find those interesting. I can't say that any one of them strikes me as why I was attracted to that. I think I'm attracted to the idea of liminal places and margins where you're between worlds and fairy is always there. I mean, fairy, the difference between fairy and myth, people say, is that, uh, you know, we, we're into the cosmos when we talk about myth and we're not we're into something more domestic when we talk about fairy and it is i think fascinating to think of fairy as that thing which is so close beside you and so possibly dangerous it's a a margin an edge and it may be you know like that there's a little mound uh, at the edge of the field where you live mm -hmm. Maybe it's a fairy right. mound. There's uh, a certain tree that has a legendary aspect and that fairies haunt and the queen of fairy has been seen there. All sorts of things like that that are part of an ordinary landscape and yet are tinged with some kind of danger and power. Uh, and I also think it's, you know, it's wonderfully interesting that fairies have this thing called glamour where they can appear to be something so potent and beautiful that it will draw you, even though underneath it's all dead leaves and rotten fruit or whatever. And um, that seems to have a very clear kind of relationship to many things in our, our lives and sometimes with mm -hmm. um, encounters that we've had with people we don't think are fairies, but who mm -hmm. 
don't turn out to be what they seemed. And then the whole idea that there's more to life than what we see in a larger sense that um, right. there's more than what we know that this world is a kind of symbolic realm that can be read and understood as more. All those things kind of link up with the idea of fairy. Right. Yeah, I do like that that distinction between fairy and myth. I mean, this this idea of Christianity as the true myth is something I've been thinking about lately. I've never been quite on board with it. I mean, it depends what you mean by myth, I guess. If you mean myth in kind of an abstract sense of story and the the value that we get from story um, versus a kind of like an abstracted account of reality, um, I would agree. But then to put it in the cat, same category with kind of the pagan myths and – well, I guess what, what, what I find interesting is <clears> – <throat> and here I'm talking more about Lewis's approach than Tolkien's – is – Lewis's approach seems to be so different from the approach like the, the early church fathers, you know, took to the pagan myths who were quite ready to appropriate aspects of uh, pagan philosophy. Um, but they didn't really take the same aspect, uh, you know, the attitude towards pagan myths, you notice, say with Justin Martyr or, mm -hmm. or somebody like that. Um, th there was a distinction there. So it wasn't that they were against appropriating anything that came from the pagan world, but um, but they seem to think as of myths as basically demonic deceptions or sort of mockeries of the, you know, the Old Testament prophecies and things like that. And that, that's kind of more the angle that's taken to a certain extent in that uh, Lord of Spirits episode. For example, when they suggest that the, the story of Prometheus may be sort of like propaganda on behalf yes. of the serpent, you know, in right. the story of the fall, which I, I, is a view that I find very compelling. Um, really interesting. And now, so, so um, I guess what I struggle with, um, not so much the idea of Christianity as the true myth, but, but the, the sort of implication that myth as a category, um, and, and I don't mean as an abstract category of storytelling or something like that, but, but as a category of, uh, say myth meaning the whole body of you know pagan stories about the gods uh, of 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 approaching them with the assumption that they are there is some underneath the literal application to actual deities is like some is always going to be some deep truth about reality that do you see what i'm saying i, I don't know that it's hel necessarily helpful to always approach approach them with the assumption that they're really conveying underneath some something deep about reality as opposed to perhaps a lie about reality or just nonsense part of it is a uh, our words that myth has so many different meanings now which it didn't in the past but you know if we right. stick to myth as a you know a story that has lasted over a great deal of time that attempts to explain something essential about the world, then we can certainly say there can be wrong myths, myths that are untrue or myths that are, you know, right as in, in the Lord of Spirits. Lord of Spirits, they uh, certainly claim that um, many myths can be propaganda for Satan. And um, so... I think you can then to kind of take the modern ideas about myth and say, okay, in some cases, yes, this is just a myth. It's not, it doesn't tell us truth about the world. Or maybe we have to turn it inside out and say, it tells us truth about the demonic world. Um, and that is opposed to, uh, you know, the Christian story so that, you know, you could take something like, all right, God breathes life into Adam and you oppose that on the other side to a pagan myth in which a pagan priest breathes the breath supposedly of life into an idol and obviously hmm. very different ideas about the world and the idol doesn't actually breathe although i did give my idol some breath 
uh, in the center of the right. wildwood. So, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, and, and the other thing is that it seems like uh, hard to reconcile the like deep truth reading with reading these myths in the in like the context of how they actually functioned in the cultures in which they were told, mm -hmm. you know, as part of this sort of now, now obviously when you get to some of the, you know, Greek and Roman poets at a certain point or some of the plays, you know, it may be at a certain point it is detached from any real religious context. And it's just, they're kind of using these stories for to, to sort of do their own thing poetically. Um, but, but um, you know, it it does seem like that that looking at this sort of like this inversion or this mockery or this propagandistic aspect it does often reveal things when you when you look at them in that in that light and so i'm not sure how to reconcile that with the sort of there's like a deep human truth underneath all or cosmic truth underneath all of these things that 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 kind of reading um again yeah but it, yeah as you say it really depends on how you define myth um to some extent um I just, uh, yeah, it, it's an interesting topic. It seems like this, this sort of like Christianity as the true myth. To Lewis Lewis is so popular that it seems like a lot of people have just sort of like accepted this idea. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah. I, I just feel like I, I'm not totally rejecting it, but I just, I'm, I'm, I'm questioning it a little bit. But the, I mean, one of the reasons I bring it up is that um, fairy seems a little bit different. Um, because it's always had this more ambiguous status because at least as it comes down to us in sort of like the European context, it does, it isn't like immediately connected to religion. It's not immediately connected to beings who are worshiped, even if it like may have sort of some genealogy in that, that way. Um, uh, and so it does seem like, it does seem like a way to explore sort of the, the, the whole like enchantment theme and the way that we view reality. And also, yes, some of these things that, you know, there's more to heaven and earth that is, that is, that is dreamt of in our philosophy, that kind of mm -hmm. aspect in a way that you're more free to play around with than if you're care, if you were say writing a, from a Christian perspective, writing a story in which your characters are, you know, um, you know, uh, Venus and whoever else or, or Odin or whatever. Um, does that make sense? It just it does seem like fairy is a more appropriate is is a more like fitting playground for a Christian, you know, fantasist in a way. I think that seems true. It's certainly an arena where you're simply not having to deal with. I mean, one of the things about Lord of the Spirits is it took so many existing stories and just flipped them upside down, you know, so that um, many stories that we thought of as like, well, like the one you mentioned, Prometheus, as completely positive, you know, yeah, we want fire. Uh, we want fire both in literal fire and we want fire of the mind and, Sure, it sounds like a wonderful story, and then Lord of Spirits comes along, and you know Father Stephen de Young and Andrew Damick just turn it absolutely upside down for us, so that we look at it in an entirely different way, and right. you know they perform that really for so many stories all at once in in that podcast, so that yeah, we see the world of myth in a very different way than we really ever have before. I don't think that right. view has really been promulgated before. And it's, it is, um, yeah. it is something that turns our normal view of myth upside down. So. Right. I mean, it is a very, like, it is a, it's almost like a patristic way of looking at it combined with, maybe some of the insights about storytelling that have come from like the more modern school of thinking about, about myth, but, but, but still looking at it from this kind of like critical patristic perspective, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I, for the listener, we actually haven't specified the title of that episode because I'm sure some people are wanting to check it out now. So the podcast is called the Lord of spirits and that episode is called a land of giants. I think, and I'll, I'll link to it in, in the show notes, but yeah. So I don't know, just listening to that, I guess what about last year or whenever I heard it, 
um, has gotten me reevaluating some of these kind of like commonplaces that we hear, you know, uh, about, you know, the function of myth or Christianity as true myth. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's all interesting stuff. And so, um, it's fascinating. Did you send them a copy of the, this book? No, I should. I did write Father Stephen to Young a note, but who knows if he ever got it. So, <laughs> I, I well, maybe I should. Do. Yeah, I'm sure they'd appreciate that. Um, okay, well, thank you, Marley, for, for coming on the podcast. I, uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. I enjoyed it. Um, and for the listener, again, the book is Saren of the Wildwood, published by Wise Blood Books. I'll link to uh, that in the show notes. And um, yeah, so uh, if you would recommend people checking out any of your other books, uh, where would be a good place to start? Maybe some of your novels. Uh, should we check out the most recent one? Is that what you would say? Um, Karis and the World of Wonders is in print. Great virtue. And yeah, still looking for readers. And I think it's been, I think it's the October choice for the National Moms Who Read group. So oh, nice. I need some readers out there. Yeah, well, that's, a, that's a good place to start. I tend to be one of those people who is described as never doing the same thing twice. It doesn't feel that way to me, but um, a lot of people hmm. find a great deal of variety. So you can you know, go up by my website and just take a, there's a page for each book and take a look. There might be something that feels right for you. Great. All right. Well, everyone, thank you for listening. I'd like to remind you also that Catholic culture, this podcast, all of our other podcasts and our website are uh, entirely donation funded. So if you'd like to help us continue the show, any of our shows, please go to Catholic culture, dot org slash donate slash audio we do uh pray for our benefactors daily and all of our listeners not just the ones who uh, who donate um so thanks everybody for listening and i'll see you next time the catholic culture podcast is a production of catholicculture.org Check out our other podcasts including way of the fathers an early church history podcast hosted by mike aquilina Catholic Culture Audiobooks, bringing to life classic Catholic writings, and Criteria, the Catholic Film Podcast, featuring deep analysis of great films from a Catholic perspective. You'll find all of this, as well as Catholic news, commentary, liturgical media resources, and much more at catholicculture.org.